This podcast is brought to you by Audible. Have you been wanting to read more, but don't seem to have the time? Well, with Audible, you can read your books without having to find the extra time in your busy schedule. Stuck in traffic on your way home from work? Why not marathon the Harry Potter books? In the gym and want to learn about the First Lady? Well, you can listen to Becoming Michelle Obama while doing Leg Day. And if you go to audibletrial.com slash cultivate, you get a month free of Audible. That includes one credit that you can trade in for any audiobook of your choice, access to thousands of audiobooks free to listen to with your account, and best of all, you have access to all of your favorite podcasts in the app as well. So be sure to go to my link, audibletrial.com slash cultivate. That's C-U-L-T-I-V, the number eight, to sign up for a free month of Audible and start reading today. Thank you, Audible, for supporting the show. We are. We are. We are Cultivate. 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 We are Cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I'm your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stangle. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. Yeah. It's going. School year is winding down. Mm-hmm. Couple weeks left. Time for movies in this in the classroom. Yeah, I think they're having some sort of fun thing at the elementary school the last week. But nice. I can't remember. I know I read something somewhere about something, but my memory is not so great. Yeah, especially in the morning on a Sunday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So let's see how this goes. <laughs> Good luck, everybody else. Good All right. Luck. So this week we are going to be discussing Florence Maybrick. Ooh, that's an um, that's a witchy name. Mm. Am I close? No. Ah. Oh. <laughs> Darn. I liked your first instinct, though. Well, let's let's dive into it. All right. So information was pulled from the following sources. A 2020 Who Do You Think You Are article by Kate Colquhoun. That sounds so like Spice Girls. Colquhoun? Colquhoun. Who do you think you are? I know. When you said Who Do You Think You Are article, I thought of it as like, Who do you think you are? (laughs) Do you even know who you are? Get the picture, duh. Oh. (laughs) Who are you? This is going to... Sound weird, but a 2016 Jack the Ripper blog post, Mm. 2015 ASD Prison Voices blog post, 2014 The Guardian article by Dinah Birch, 1905 Project Gutenberg book titled My 15 Lost Years by Florence Elizabeth Maybrick, two links on Genie.com, Liverpool Picture Book Online, Oxford Scholarship Online article by John Emsley, Murderpedia and two links on Wikipedia. Mm. Okay, so if that blog post isn't a red herring, she was accused of being some of the Jack the Ripper crimes. But if you'll remember from Lena's episode, there was only one female accused of that. Yeah. So there's some sort of different connection. She was his baby mama. <laughs> <laughs> and they had murder babies. And links to all of these articles will be included (laughs) in the show notes. Yay! Murder babies. Let's go. All right. Florence Elizabeth Chandler was born in Mobile, Alabama on September 3rd, 1862, to parents William Gaines Chandler, who was a banker, and Caroline Holbrook. Her her father passed away about two months before she was born, and her mother Mm -hmm. went on to remarry Lieutenant Franklin Bach Duberry, who died at sea on May 27, 1864, after he had sustained a mortal injury. Wow. So so she probably has 
an ab- father, absent father problem. It's like, they just keep dying on me. <laughs> I don't even exist yet. Her mother remarried for the third time to a man named Baron Adolf von Roques, a cavalry officer in the German army in 1872 when Florence was 10. So she likes military men. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And is, is touring the cuisine. <laughs> Feel French, mm-hmm, yeah, German. Okay, I wonder if she picked up the languages too. I don't know. She was like, "I'm gonna start with a banker because I like money," <laughs> and that didn't work out so well. So now we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna go with aggressive fighters. Yeah, who are away for long periods of time. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> oh, got murdered. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so. So let's do an aggressive fighter that doesn't fight. Yeah. <laughs> Only manages fights. <laughs> yeah. Let's do a baron. Sounds good. Perfect. <laughs> Fast forward eight years to March 12th, 1880, when Florence accompanied her mother aboard the SS Baltic during one of their many travels, this time to Paris. It was on this voyage that Florence would meet James Maybrick, a cotton merchant from Liverpool, England. Many thought their unlikely friendship turned courtship was a bit strange. But by the end of their trip, 18-year-old Florence and 42-year-old James decided to marry. Yeah, I know people would think that's weird, but I feel like that was probably still fairly typical at that time. I mean, it happens today still, you know? Yep. But I feel like it would be encouraged potentially by her mother. Of like, this man with prospects is pursuing you. Mm-hmm. And you're go- you don't want to be a thorn back, do you? <laughs> Get married now. Sell, sell, sell. It's a seller's market. Before they all start dying on you and you end mm-hmm. up like me. Right. Hopefully this cotton merchant doesn't die at sea. <laughs> he dies in a horrible cotton fire. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite. Oh, no. They're both just elementals, and they keep murdering their spouses in different elements. There you go. Air, <laughs> water, fire. <laughs> Earth, landslide. <Earth>. <laughs> just kills the cotton crops. It's like evil Captain Planet. Right? <laughs> you, you old murder Captain Planet. <laughs> he had the evilest of mullets. <laughs> James Maybrick was born October 25th, 1838, in Liverpool to parents William and Susanna Maybrick. He was the third of seven sons, having been named after a brother who had passed away the year before his birth. Yeah, Yeah, that's kind of, I don't like that. We we couldn't use that name, but still really like it, so we're giving it to you. You shall be James, too. That's a little dark. Yeah. Probably common during the time. Oh, it was super common. Yeah. I mean, infant death was so common because of all the diseases. Well, remember Marianne Cotton? How many kids did she have that had the same name? There was like six of them that she gave the same name to. I can't remember what the name was, but. She just, she was just lazy though. She was. Hers was a little different. Well, and I'm sure she was just like, well, I'm going to murder you soon anyway, but I really like this name. (laughs) So. Right. We're just going to keep this ball or, or I met someone I didn't like with this name. So I'm just going to keep naming you that. Yeah. So that I'm reminded that it's okay to murder you. God. Small child. <laughs> Go check out our Marianne Cotton episode if you want to hear what the name was. Because I don't remember. Yeah. But, but wait until after this episode's done, please. Yeah. Don't, don't just skip this. How dare you? Don't just leave us. Oh, my God. I have separation anxiety. Don't do that. (laughs) Wait, come back. No. (laughs) Maybrick, a cotton broker, was required to travel frequently for work between his office in Liverpool and the United States. He set up a branch office of his company in Norfolk, Virginia in 1871. Of course. And three years later in 1874, while in Virginia, he contracted malaria. (laughs) Haha. I mean, oh no. Oh, no. Part of his treatment was a medication called Fowler's Medicine that contained arsenic and strychnine. Sounds like a great idea. 
good job, pharmaceuticals of yesteryear. What if we what if we counteract poison with more poison? <laughs> but like small amounts. Mm-hmm. Microdosing. Oh my god. Microdoses Stry- of poison. Strychnine. Okay. That'll come that'll come back. Well, let's just wipe out their innards and hope for the best. Yep. You don't need your intestines. Mm-mm. The pair were married in London at St. James Church, Piccadilly, on July 27, 1881. A year into their marriage, Florence gave birth to a son named James Bobo Chandler Maybrick. Bobo. Bobo. In 1882. And four years later, she would give birth to a daughter named Gladys Evelyn Maybrick in 1886. For a time, the family lived in Norfolk, Virginia as well, where James had a home, as I mentioned. It would make sense that she would prefer the United States, too, because mm-hmm. I feel like that's probably where she was the majority of her life. In 1884, so three years after they got married, the family settled in Battle Creek's house in Egbeth, which is a suburb of Liverpool, where James worked. Egg buff. Mm-hmm. Man, the UK and their names for towns and villages. I love it so much. It's just, it's so fun. It is. They're like, what should we call it? I don't know, egg buff? Okay. <laughs> Here you go. Works for me. Meanwhile, in the United States, we have misery and despair. <laughs> Death Valley. <laughs> <laughs> a million and one Springfields. Mm-hmm. This idyllic home would bear witness to several scenes of marital strife, but not all of it was bad. Okay. The couple employed a cook, two maids, and a nanny. Florence was given an allowance of seven pounds a week, or about 463 pounds a week today. Dang. Like many teenagers, because remember she was like, well, I suppose at this time she would have been in her early 20s. But, but still, still, early 20s. You sh- you shop a lot. Yep. Especially, I bet she wasn't poor when her mom married the Baron. No. So she's probably used to a certain lifestyle. And if they regularly went on like steamship trips, especially to Cruises Paris. and stuff, yeah. I'm sure she was used to a certain lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Allegedly. One can assume. We're assuming. She loved to be the center of attention and would throw and attend lavish parties and indulge in expensive tastes during her time at Battle Creek's house, and she soon ran up a debt. Of course. Because $400 in change a week is not enough. Not for Florence. Wow. That's still, to this day, like 400 bucks a week is a very good paycheck at the end mm-hmm. of the month. That's an excellent paycheck <laughs> at yep. the end of every month. Yep. Dang. This lifestyle wouldn't last long, as James soon informed her that they couldn't spend money they didn't have. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> <laughs> and so it, instead... He invented the credit card. <laughs> this is where the credit card was invented. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the Maybrick. The Maybrick card. <laughs> <laughs> Why won't my wife stop? <laughs> it's just, it's just a, an IOU brick. <laughs> yep. <laughs> They're just bricks you tie IOUs to when you throw it through like shop yeah. windows. <laughs> IOU. <laughs> I'll fix that too. <laughs> Sorry. My wife. (laughs) And even after attempting to put her on a budget, Florence refused to stop her spending, which resulted in her borrowing against land back in America that she expected to inherit, as well as borrow against the worth of her jewelry. I have a feeling that's not going to end well. As you can imagine, (laughs) this wasn't the brightest of moves on her part. Florence later confided to her mother, quote, whenever the doorbell rings, I am, I feel ready to faint for fear it is someone coming to have an account paid, end quote. Yep. Yeah. Break some delicate kneecaps. Yep. Yep. The pair's marriage woes cannot be put solely on the shoulders of Florence, however. 
Due to the nature of his job, James traveled several times a year to America in order to broker cotton. And it was during one of these business trips in 1887 that Florence was made aware that James had not only been keeping a mistress, but that said mistress had also given birth to five of his children. Yeah, I was just going to say he had a secret family, didn't he? Mm -hmm. At least one. Yep. Probably more. Not only that, but he'd also been paying her 100 pounds or roughly 6,700 pounds today annually. Dang. That's not that's not nearly enough for five children, but sure. No, but it's just enough where it could like go under the radar. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just a little blip. Nobody yep. will notice. Yep. Except for Florence. <laughs> <laughs> In addition to his mistress, it was later discovered that James had a common law wife named Sarah Ann Robertson. I'm sorry. Where was he living with her to become common law? I don't know. This must Without have been... Her? This must have been prior to when he married Florence. Because keep in mind, he's he was 42 at the time they married. So. Yeah, so he was almost double her age. No, he was double her age. Yep. Yeah. So. Do common law marriages dissolve if you move out? Not really. I don't I know don't, how that works. I don't know. If someone knows how common law marriages worked in the 1800s, let us know. I didn't Google that. Or in, <laughs> or in like general, you know, because like. It's not a common practice anymore because I'm. Oh. From what I remember, you had to be living together for at least eight years to be considered common law. Mm-hmm. And then they upped it to 10 at one point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Add to this the fact that James had a drug addiction, and you can see well, why excessive spending wasn't the only cause of tension in their marriage. Oh, fun. All I can think of now is the Johnny Depp trial when he's like, Aquaman, <laughs> stealing Amber Heard's wig. <laughs> so now I'm just imagining this guy smoking opium, stealing like a, a hat pin or something from her. James was a hypochondriac and suffered from an addiction to arsenic, Ooh. a drug that was popular with many men during this period of time and which he had become addicted to when he was treated for malaria back in 1874. How do you become addicted to arsenic? I don't know. It had to have been mixed with something else. He was known to ingest a variety of tonics that included strychnine, belladonna, phosphoric acid, or arsenic. Yeah. The belladonna belladonna would have made it addicting. Mm -hmm. opium it was noted after his death that local druggists such as chemist edwin garnet heaton had sold him large quantities of arsenic which will come into play later again later even though now we realize how toxic each of these substances are in the late 1800s small doses of poisons were part of a number of remedies and regularly administered by doctors (laughs) microdosing At one point in time, James was visiting the chemist on Exchange Street East up to five times a day to get his pick-me-up. And by 1887, it was causing so much havoc to his personality that he soon became short-tempered and would start regularly beating Florence. Yeah, because, I mean, he's poisoning himself slowly. Yep. So he's probably rapidly deteriorating his brain and his organs. Yep. Potentially putting himself into like rapid Alzheimer's. Like mm-hmm. there's a lot of stuff he could have been doing with that. Yep. Well, that sucks. Yep. Left alone for long stretches of time while her husband was traveling to America and no doubt enjoying the affections of his mistress, Florence decided to take part in her own affairs. At one point in time, she enjoyed the attention of a young cotton broker named Alfred Briarly, as well as the affections of James's own younger brother, Edwin. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So she just hit it where it hurt. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go after your competitor and your brother. Yep. Your younger competitor and yeah. your younger brother. Yep. I couldn't find an exact birth date for Edwin, so I'm unsure how old he was in relation to Florence. I don't quite know. Her affair with Alfred lasted until March 1889, when he revealed to her that he was in love with someone else, and she told him they should end it. Which, 
Okay. Yeah. Florence wasn't discreet when it came to her extramarital relations, and upon learning of her dalliances with Alfred, his competitor, James threatened divorce. He was so furious with her that he drew up a new will, excluding her from it. Ah, here comes the murder. The following day, (laughs) Florence went to visit the family physician, Dr. Hopper, telling him that she felt unwell. When he pointed out her black eye, she told him about the row she'd had with her husband, how he had hit her, and how she wanted a divorce. The doctor was able to get the pair to reconcile and even convinced James to pay off his wife's debts. Okay. That's strange for a doctor to do. Okay. Yeah. He must have been really tight with the family to be able to have that sort of sway. Mm -hmm. Florence also spoke with Dr. Hopper about her concern over James's drug addictions. She confided in him that he regularly took arsenic in a cup of beef tea every day. (laughs) No! The beef tea. Beef tea. As well as a tonic that also contained arsenic. He would also regularly ingest a tonic containing strychnine each day, and even though Dr. Hopper tried to convince James to stop, he refused to do so. Things between the pair took a turn for the worst when James took ill on Saturday, April 27th, 1889, suffering from digestive upset. James had given himself a double dose of strychnine. That'll fix it. Which, we said it a lot in this episode so far, but for those that don't know, it's a highly toxic compound that's commonly found in pesticides. Yeah. So essentially, it would probably bleach your innards. Yeah, something. Just kind of shave a lining. Yeah, eat away at the lining of your internal organs. Your insides. At one point, he was even given a tonic that contained prussic acid, or hydrogen cyanide. What? Yeah. Dr. Humphreys, who was the children's doctor, came to visit the home on the 28th after James's condition had worsened, and he also came on Monday and Tuesday. Upon examination, Dr. Humphreys proceeded to treat him for acute dyspepsia, or indigestion, Yeah. and put him on a strict diet. That'll fix it. Yeah. It's probably just a bunch of beef tea. <laughs> it's just only beef tea. Bone broth for the yep. rest of your, la- <laughs> your days. Yep. Straight liquids. By the following day, James felt well enough to go into work until Friday, when he became ill again, complaining that he had a pain in his legs. Mm. On Saturday, James spent the bulk of the day vomiting, complaining that his hands felt numb. He continued to vomit on Sunday and Monday, and each day Dr. Humphreys came to check on him. Hand numbing. Yeah. That's strychnine, though, isn't it? I don't what know. Was the poisoning where where they started to like become paralyzed? I can't yeah. remember. Marianne Cotton used it a lot. I thought. I don't know. I don't remember. When I first heard about the pain in the legs, I was like, "Did he have diabetes?" Like, well, with all that drug use, I'm sure his nerves were shot. So yeah. Like, and he could have had a pulmonary embolism at any given time. Yeah. An embol- or, yeah, an embolism, just in general. Yeah. I mean, it would make sense that he'd have nerve damage after how It'd many be years? So painful. An undiagnosed embolism? Yeah. Ugh. By Tuesday, James started to once again feel better, but his brother Edwin, who started to stay at Battle Crease after returning from a trip to the U.S., asked James to get a second opinion. Dr. Carter arrived at the home at 5 p.m. that day, and after an examination, determined that he was suffering from acute dyspepsia, just as Dr. Humphreys had, and put him on a strict diet, just as Dr. Humphreys had before him. So just like confirming, this is what we think it is. Yep, indigestion. We did it. Congratulations, everybody. Yep. We don't have Pepto-Bismol, so here's some prussic acid. (laughs) Enjoy. Uh, Yeah. Wednesday, May 8th, Florence wrote a letter to Alfred, which was intercepted by Alice Yap, the children's nanny, who hated Florence. In fact, it appeared that everyone who lived in the Battle Crease home, including James' brother Edwin, seemed to hate Florence. Each letter that Florence wrote, regardless of its recipient, was intercepted by Nanny Yap, who then turned them over to Edwin. Oh, so they never even got sent? 
correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ew. Edwin shared the contents of these letters with his brother, Michael Maybrick, who, as the eldest son, was the unofficial head of the family. It was under Michael's orders that Florence was stripped of her duties as mistress of the house and instead put under house arrest. Weird. That's some, like, medieval stuff. Yeah. Michael had James's will changed, giving himself power of attorney over his estate. The ill-begotten letter to Alfred read in part as follows. Quote, Dearest, I cannot answer your letter fully today, my darling, but relieve your mind of all fear of discovery now and in the future. M has been delirious since Sunday, and I know now that he is perfectly ignorant of everything. Excuse this scrawl, my own darling, but I dare not leave the room for a moment, and I do not know when I shall be able to write to you again. In haste, yours ever, Flory. End quote. So pretty damning note to have your yeah. your nanny send out. Thursday, May 9th, a nurse that was tending to her ailing husband stated that she had seen Florence tamper with a bottle of Valentine's meat juice, which was essentially broth given to people suffering from stomach issues to keep them from starving to death. Okay. So it was some sort of meat broth that had vitamins and stuff added to it. And she was tampering with it. Apparently, after the bottle was examined, it was determined that a half grain of arsenic was inside the bottle, but James never drank any of the bottle's contents. Okay. Two days later, on May 11th, 1889, James died at his home at the age of 50. Following his death, both of his brothers, who were extremely suspicious of Florence, had their brother's body examined. The autopsy revealed trace amounts of arsenic, but not nearly enough to be considered a lethal dose by any means. Yeah. And given the fact that he would often take arsenic, it was hard to say whether the amount that was found in his system was self-administered or not. Right. On May 13th, the coroner's report listed his cause of death as, quote, due to inflammation of the stomach and bowels set up by some irritant poison, end quote. You know, the ones we prescribe. Yep. Fun fact, in the week before (laughs) his death, James had been given up to 20 separate doses of various poisons in an effort to cure his illness. Yeah. All these different doctors. Yep. They didn't, probably didn't talk. (laughs) Prussic acid. It's great. Fixes everything. I didn't realize it was such a short amount of time, too. She met him when he was 42. That's... Yeah. That's a really volatile period of time. Yeah, just eight years. Wow. James's body was exhumed on May 30th for re-examination. An analysis of his liver, intestines, and spleen found less than a half grain of arsenic with zero trace of it in his stomach. Yeah, because he's decomposing. Yeah. However, trace amounts of strychnine, hyoscine, morphia, and prussic acid were found the last two of which had been prescribed and administered to James by doctors. Yeah. I'm failing to see where she murdered him. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much malpractice at this point. Yep. Unintentional malpractice. Yep. It wasn't long after his death that an inquest was held and Florence was charged with the murder of James Maybrick. Florence was held at the Walton jail hospital. During the trial, which started on July 31st, 1889, at St. George's Hall in Liverpool, she was accused of murdering her husband with a lethal dose of arsenic, even though the medical examiners testified that the amount that was found in his body post-mortem wasn't enough to have killed him. In fact, large amounts of arsenic were found at the Maybrick home, and although many attributed the quantity to James' known drug addiction, there were others who felt it proved Florence's guilt as his murderer. Man. A police search of the Maybrick home found enough arsenic packets to kill everyone in the home several times over. That's insane. And they were using it as medicine. Yep. Not only that, but the servants of the home noted that Florence had been soaking arsenic-rich flypapers in a basin of water on her dressing table, stating that she had used the water to poison their master. Arsenic water was a common beauty treatment of the time, 
And since her cosmetic prescription had expired, she had started to make the concoction herself at home. Mm. The servants also claimed that the food that was brought back to the kitchens from his sickbed looked and tasted different from the food that had been prepared for him and brought up from the kitchens. Mm -hmm. Judge James Fitzjames Stephen was the judge that presided over the trial, and his opinions of Florence were quite nasty, to put it nicely. At one point during her trial, he stated that her known infidelity should be reason enough for the jury to condemn her. Awesome. Quote, you must consider a horrible and dreadful thought that a woman should be plotting the death of her husband in order that she might be left at liberty to follow her own degrading vices, end quote. He's cute. Mm -hmm. Love him. It came to light that Florence had recently been speaking with solicitors in London regarding obtaining a divorce, which would have been difficult but not unheard of following the 1857 Divorce Act. Her lawyer reminded the jury that she was not on trial for, um, for immorality, but for murder. So that yep. shouldn't be considered at all. But probably was. Oh, yeah. If you think about it, Florence had very little to gain by killing her husband. Mm -hmm. The inheritance that she received upon James' death to provide for her and her children was next to nothing compared to what she could have received if they had legally separated prior to his death, a.k.a. child support. Yeah. Although on the flip side of that, if they had gotten divorced, as was often the case, she as the woman would have been vilified in the eyes of Victorian society, and she may have even lost custody of her children. Yeah, that was coming. Yep. On August 7th, 1889, after just 43 minutes of deliberation by the all-male jury, Florence was found guilty and sentenced to death by hanging. <sighs> Wow. Okay. Her sentence was commuted two weeks later to life in prison, and she was forced to spend the first nine months of her imprisonment in solitary confinement before being moved to a cell that fell under the silent system, which meant that one must be silent at all times unless they wanted to be punished. So they forced her to become insane, essentially. Pretty much. Florence served 14 years, seven each in Woking and Aylesbury prisons, before she was released at the age of 42 in January 1904. For six months following her release, she stayed in a convent in Truro, Cornwall, before her mother, Baroness von Rokes, met up with Florence and the pair traveled to America together. Florence returned home, I'm assuming to Virginia. Yeah where she wrote a book about her ordeal titled My Lost 15 Years. Mm -hmm. She traveled around the country for two years, telling her story before deciding that she just couldn't do it anymore. She worked for a time as a housekeeper before becoming a recluse. She died penniless and alone, living in a squalid three-room cabin near Gaylordsville, South Kent, Connecticut, on October 23, 1941, at the age of 79. Mm -hmm. She died having never seen her children again following her trial and incarceration. Dang. What a horrible life. Yep. The Maybrick children, James and Gladys, were raised by the family's doctor, Charles Chinner Fuller, and his wife, Gertrude. Yeah, he was way too involved in their lives then. Well, this was a different doctor, so I have no idea where this guy came into play. James Jr. would later change his last name to Fuller prior to his death in 1911. At the time, he had been a mining engineer in British Columbia, Canada, working uh -oh. at the Leroy Gold Mine. He died at the age of 29 after mistakenly drinking a glass containing cyanide that he believed was just water. I don't know how you have a glass of cyanide just sitting out. Yeah. That seems what? shady, Boots. Very shady. Especially if he's working in a gold mine. Mm -hmm. Gladys eventually moved to the Isle of Wight with her uncle Michael and Aunt Laura before marrying Frederick James Corbin in Hampstead, London in 1912. She died in South Wales in 1971 at the age of 85, where the couple had spent the bulk of their later years together. You may be wondering what this all has to do with Jack the Ripper, since... 
several of my sources were from Jack the Ripper sites. Mm -hmm. You just wouldn't know by the name of it that it was Jack the Ripper. James Maybrick himself was suspected of being Jack the Ripper. Oh. There is a theory that Florence learned of his crimes and took it upon herself to poison and kill him in order to make the murders stop. As coincidentally, the murders mysteriously ended once Florence was locked up in prison following James's death. Hmm. This theory came about when in 1992, a document that was purported to be James Maybrick's diary surfaced in which he claimed to be Jack the Ripper. The diary in question never mentions Maybrick by name, but heavily hints at his identity based on a number of events and habits that would have been consistent with the life that he led. It is claimed that the author of the diary details the actions and crimes of Jack the Ripper, taking credit for the five victims as well as two other murders that have not been linked to the Ripper case. Hmm. The diary came to light thanks to an unemployed former Liverpool scrap metal dealer named Michael Barrett. <laughs> what? What is this? Who are these people? Who received it from a friend at the pub named Tony Devereaux. When asked about it, the story suddenly changed to that it had in fact been in Mr. Barrett's wife, Anne's family, for years. Mm -hmm. Apparently, Anne had given the diary to Tony, asking him to give it to Michael because she worried that if she gave it to him, he'd try to ask her father about it, and because the two didn't get along, it would cause problems. What a fun game of telephone. Right? This just seems mm -hmm. like some Jerry Springer bullshit. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Regardless, it was published as The Diary of Jack the Ripper in 1993 to mixed reviews. Yeah. Several people thought it was a hoax. Others were like, oh, yeah, that's totally true. Several thin layer chromatography tests were conducted on the diary ink to see if they could date match if the book had, in fact, been written when it was purportedly written. Mm hmm. Two of the first four tests stated that it's possible the dye used came from somewhere between 1867 and 1888. Three other tests were conducted with none of them stating one way or the other that a specific compound called chloroastamide was present. This chemical was a preservative that was first introduced in 1857, but it wasn't commonly used until 1972. Okay. Another potential link to James as Jack the Ripper is the gentleman's pocket watch that was presented to Wallacey in June 1993. This is like one of those um, auction places. Mm -hmm. The watch, which was made by William Verity of Rothwell in 1847 to 1848, had J. Maybrick scratched into the inside cover along with the phrase, I am Jack and the initials of the five Ripper victims. Ew. The watch was examined using an electron microscope by Dr. Stephen Turgus at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. According to him, and later Dr. Robert Wilde of Bristol University, who examined the watch with an electron microscope and auger electron spectroscopy, noted that the marks appeared to be genuine as it would take an exceptional amount of skill to be able to polish and age brass in a way that would be able to fool such advanced scientific equipment. Hmm. And that is the story of Florence Maybrick and her potential husband's ties with Jack the Ripper. Wow. What a horrible story. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it was all bad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Welcome to Castles and Cryptids, a comedy podcast brought to you by a couple of Canadian chicks. I'm Alana. And I'm Kelsey. Do you want to know the difference between a Sasquatch and a Yeti? Can you tell an urban legend from a cautionary tale? 
Follow us down the rabbit hole to find out. We love all things cryptic, conspiracy theory, or unexplained, and the truly horrifying, our own bloody history. Join us for monsters and murders, and probably a tangent or two. All that and more on Castles and Cryptids, Sasquatch Repellent not included. This week's podcast plug is the Castles and Cryptids podcast. In this show, Alana and Kelsey cover a variety of bizarre cases, such as haunted objects, medical mysteries, and a variety of conspiracies. They also cover crime as well. In fact, they recently published a two-part deep dive into Jeffrey Dahmer, if that's your thing. Yeah. Don't eat before. Nope. If you like weird shit, cryptids, and a little bit of everything, go give Castles and Cryptids a listen. Sounds awesome. And this week's listener question comes from Ashley from the Studying Scarlet and Pineapple Pizza podcast. And she wants to know if Maddie had to change her signature catchphrase because she could no longer say wow, what would she change it to? Okay, I feel attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since I said that word several times for this episode. I don't know. Oh boy. Jeez. Could go like more Minnesotan, I guess. Golly. My first thought was no, because you say that a lot too. <laughs> no. Cool. I'm a, I really am the Robin to your Batman. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it would be. I only know those two words. <laughs> <laughs> wow. No. <laughs> yep. Checked out. Checks out. So what's something good you'd like to share? Well, one, we've had really nice weather this whole week in Minnesota, and I've been very thankful for it. It's been nice mm -hmm. to see the sun and open the windows. Mm -hmm. But I had a particularly like bummer of a day earlier this week, and my fiancé knew that it was going to be a bad day and he had come home late. He came home late like every every day this week because his work was taking him to places like three hours away from home. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but on this particular day, he had taken five, three stops and picked out two bouquets of flowers for me Aww. to come home to because he knew that I was going to have a bad day. So... I got flowers this week and it was very nice and they're still alive and they're still looking really beautiful and smelling beautiful. And it's just, it's just a nice thing. And I also got to like brush horses yesterday, which I've never been able to do. And that was kind of fun. Nice. Yeah. What about you? My something good is weird. So you know how I've been worried about Charlie for like the past two mm -hmm. weeks, yeah. three, three weeks. I live Island thing? The ICAP thing, yeah. So he had a full shed yesterday, and the ICAPs are gone. Yeah. So, like, like the, the, the shed. So he looks much better. He was moving around a lot at night because he's most active at night. So he's feeling better. So hopefully. he's feeling better, and I was very happy. So I sent a note to his vet and was like, we did it. <laughs> He's all better. But if things change, I'll let you know. So so that was nice. I was so happy when we came home from running errands and I saw like the little pile of shed. And I was like, oh. yeah. so then I immediately like pulled him out of his hide. And I was like, I got to look at your face. <laughs> <laughs> look me in the eyes. Let me look at your face and touch it. That's enough snake talk. Let's shut her down. Okay. <laughs> you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. We also have a YouTube channel if you'd like to subscribe. We have a P.O. box if you'd like to send us something in the mail. You can do so at Yield Crime Podcast, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. You can email us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. This week was our last listener question. So uh -oh. send us your questions or that segment's going to go bye-bye. <laughs> Please and thank you. 
We did. I have to give a shout out to listener Elizabeth. She sent us a hilarious meme that you need to go on Instagram or Twitter to look at. It was so funny. Okay. Awesome. She was like, I saw this and immediately thought of you guys. And oh. I was like, oh, my God, this is the best. It has something to do with the Oregon Trail. That's like a spoiler. But oh, heck yeah. it was so good. If you'd like to support the show, but you can't do so financially, we totally understand given what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. You can leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, and leave a rating on Spotify. This week's review comes from Apple Podcasts from North Penn Rugby, and they say, Bone-chilling podcast, five stars. What a scary show. (laughs) 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 Great host with great content from the Tyler perspective. Thank you. If you'd like to support the show financially, you can leave a one-time donation at Buy Me a Coffee. You can also subscribe to our Patreon for as low as a dollar a month to get early ad-free access to our content. And if you want to rep our merch, there is a sale going on on our Tee Public from May 26th to May 30th. Tees will be $13 and everything else will be up to 40% off, which is nice. awesome because normally it's 35% off. Yeah. That's really good. Yeah. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale. As old as crime.